So he's riding several horses, and he's going to pull them in a lot of directions. And like this thing of the Israeli military killing nine people in international waters, I wouldn't want to have to be the president of the United States and try and cover with Israel doing a lot of things. Just if it was London or this oil spill in the Gulf by like BP, BP, British Petroleum, which tried to rebrand itself as Beyond Petroleum, but I, I guess now they're in deep doo doo. So he's in a tough spot, and I don't envy it, but I know I'd rather have a president who's smart and read book, reads books than a president who doesn't read books like the previous president. So it's, it's a mixed, mixed blessing. Uh, speaking of BP, one last question. You, I'm sure you've been watching There's an instructive lesson from history. Decades ago, there was an oil spill in California off the coast of Santa Barbara, and it found some of the most expensive beaches in the world. And that touched off a movement in California to ban offshore oil drilling. And it's been very successful. We haven't had problems like, I mean, anywhere there's oil, you have problems, but nothing like what's going on in the Gulf. So hopefully, and I think this is a good general principle in life, when something bad happens, you try to take it as an educable moment. How can we get something positive? What can we learn from this? Can it stimulate us to do policies that move us in a different direction? And the direction we need to move in is getting our federal government away from the control of the oil companies and the state governments as well. When you look at who finances these politicians, it's big corporations. So one of the things we're proposing is to have a website called whoownsgovernment.com, and it will be to build a campaign around the country to say police and firefighters, any public servants, they wear a uniform. Congress are public servants, so they should wear a uniform too. And the uniform will be like a NASCAR jumpsuit with decals of the corporations that give them money in relative size to the amount of money they get. Because if you want transparency, democracy is supposed to be about transparency, you know, you could look at it and say, oh, it's the senator from Exxon, the senator from Chevron, because they have those logos. And you could do a $5,000 prize for high school students. Whoever designs the best version of that jumpsuit with their representative in Congress, so they do some research, go to the Federal Election Commission website, where to get his money from, take Photoshop, take the logos off the websites of those companies, put them on there. $5,000 prize. I, I think there's some high school students that would be motivated by that. Green Festival Center. <laughs> yeah, well, no, we're, we're never going to, we're not allowed to as a non-profit. Yeah, you're probably not. We're even restricted to only 5% of our budget can be spent on what's called lobbying. If we mail out a letter to our members, our thousands of members, suggesting that they uh, pressure a representative in Congress about a piece of legislation. That's considered lobby. So only 5% of your budget can be spent that way. It's a severe restriction. That same restriction doesn't apply to banks and corporations. They can just give all the money they want, including to judges that are elected. So we're going to have judges that are beholden to corporate money because that's what got them elected. That's, that's not a good way to preserve the Constitution. Yeah, and I know that I said the week the question was the last one, but I have one last question. This will be really last one. Um, so, obviously, you probably see the Green Bus take place in San Francisco, Chicago, all these different cities. How do you think it differs regionally? Well, the, the financial success is dependent on the density of the green economy in that area. There are some cities where you just couldn't do this show. It wouldn't work out financially. You have to have enough companies that are going to buy exhibit booths so you can pay the bills. It's very expensive to do these shows. It's about a $900,000 show. And there's so many different ways you can lose money that you know, you're know you lucky to just survive. And this is our ninth year, so you can help a lot. Um, and what's going on is we're realizing that this green economy is now dense enough and there's enough awareness and there's enough companies that we need to move this into a real estate, a green market, where all the green economy 
stuff is all in one place. Right now, that doesn't exist, and it's really dumb. So you can have a huge, there's a lot of uh, real estate now going empty, a lot of commercial real estate is going bankrupt and empty. So there are a lot of buildings around. The basic idea is you bring together all of these companies and put them in the same place. Fixed up nice, not just temporary pipe and drape and that kind of thing, but really fixed up nice so that consuming public knows if you want one place where, you know, the chemical-free body lotions and, you know, recycled paper and bamboo floors and solar energy and all these, you know, efficient lighting and all that stuff is all in one place, it would make it easier and it would help accelerate the transition to the green economy. Because if we don't accelerate the transition to the green economy, future generations are going to pay a really nasty price. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And it was a pleasure meeting you. I'm very impressed by you. Thank you. It was a good speech. Turn around and, and close it up. Um, I'm Adora Spisak from the Washington State Convention Center in Seattle, Washington at the Green Festival. Thank you very much for watching.